Today we are very blessed to have Judge Thomas Griffith with us here. Um, that was a tongue twister, Griffith with us. Um, you should try that sometime. Uh, it's, a, it's a delight to have him. Uh, Judge Griffith was appointed to the U.S. Court of Appeals in June 2005. He served as general counsel to the Advisory Commission on Electronic Commerce as assistant to the president and general counsel of BYU. And uh, so he's, you know, for a while he was here as, as BYU's chief lawyer, which would be a, a fun job, it sounds to me like. Uh, and as a member of the executive committee of the American Bar Association's Central European and Eurasian Law Initiative. And from 1995 through 1999, he was Senate Legal Counsel of the United States, the Chief Legal Officer of the U.S. Senate. So that was in the late 90s under President Clinton's presidency when he was in uh, with the U.S. Senate. Uh, Judge Griffith has engaged in private practice uh, from 1985 through 1995. And in 1999 and 2000, worked in North Carolina and Washington, D.C., where his primary areas of emphasis were commercial and corporate litigation. He graduated from BYU in 1978 with a degree in, what was it, English? Or? Humanities, and comparative Humanities and Comparative Literature, and from the University of Virginia Law School in 1985. And you might recognize him as well as our Constitution Day speaker a few weeks ago where he gave an outstanding forum on the importance of uh, really knowing the Constitution. So we're very pleased today to welcome Judge Griffith with us. Well, thank you. Although this is uh, billed as a lecture, I don't intend this to be um, much like a lecture. I hope it's not. I, I hope it's a, a, a time that uh, we can visit and lots of question and answers. And so, the, the, the way we've done this in the past, and I'll, I'll, I'll do it again until I see people's head dropping off asleep, and then I'll, 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 I'll start singing and dancing or something. But the way we've done it in the past is, uh, as egotistical as it sounds, I'll, I'll tell you about my, my career. I'll tell you a little bit about the job that I do now, what it means to be a federal appeals court judge, particularly on the, the unusual court that I sit on in, in Washington, D.C., sort of how that happened, what you do, how that happened, and then a little bit about my career. But the, the point of all this, I think, is to, uh, to get you thinking and asking questions about uh, what's ahead of you, what's ahead of you now. I, I, will, I, I have worked into my remarks time for question and answer, but I hope, I hope that you'll feel free at any point to, to stop me and ask questions. Now, I've done this for a number of years, and I've always begun this way, and no one has ever stopped me to ask a question. So be the first, uh, be the first to do that. See if we can break out of this uh, mold. Well, first, let me start where uh, uh, I'm glad to be here. I love uh, BYU, uh, love what it stands for, I love what it's done, uh, and more than anything, I love what it can yet be. And uh, you're part of that, and so I'm uh, gl glad to be here uh, with my friend uh, Darren Hawkins, and uh, uh, honored to be here. Well, let me start with a little bit about uh, my current job. Uh, the, f the full title of my job is Circuit Judge for the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. Uh, now, I'm certain all of you are aware of the way the, the uh, federal court system, federal judiciary is structured, but there are three, generally three levels of courts in the federal system and divided up uh, uh, in, into various regions. And the three levels of courts are, of course, the, the trial court. Uh, they make TV shows and movies about trial courts because they can be rather dramatic. Juries sometimes, cross-examinations, dramatic moments. Uh, someone who loses at that level uh, frequently takes an appeal to the Court of Appeals. That's where I am. Now, I don't believe there's ever been a movie or a TV show done about a Court of Appeals. Uh, our work is uh, pretty monastic, pretty contemplative. Um, uh, if, if you ever come to a Court of Appeals argument, and you're, if you're in D.C., you're always welcome to come. They're open to the public. Um, it's uh, lawyers standing in front of three judges and uh, arguing cases, and it's, that's all there is. There's no witnesses, there's, uh, you know, people don't raise their voice and make dramatic arguments trying to 
appeal to the uh, passions of the decision maker. It's very reasoned, um, uh, fact-intensive, law-intensive. Uh, in fact, uh, were you to come to a Court of Appeals argument, my guess is you probably wouldn't follow too much of it. Now, that's a great uh, incentive for you to come, I'm sure. But you probably wouldn't follow too much of it because because what's happening at the Court of Appeals is you're in, as you're watching it, on the very tail end of a, of a long process that culminates in the lawyers appearing before the three judges uh, making argument. And that long process uh, ha has begun months before that, uh, perhaps years before that in the case of the lawyers, but at least for the judges, months before that, uh, where uh, written argument is submitted to them in the form, and su submitted to the judges in the form of briefs. We spend a lot of time reading that and studying that and come prepared to ask questions of the lawyers about that. So you see, you're coming in at the, the tail end of the conversation. So, uh, uh, but, but anyway, that's, uh, that's what happens at a, at a Court of Appeals. Of course, there's a level above uh, the, the, the Court of Appeals, and that's the, that's the Supreme Court. And as you may know, the United States is divided up into a number of regions. Uh, Utah happens to be in what's called the Tenth Circuit. Uh, it, the, 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 the Tenth Circuit is headquartered in Denver. That's where they go to have Court of Appeals arguments uh, in, 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 uh, if you're in a federal court case that's come from Utah. Uh, I happen to sit on the Court of Appeals that has the smallest geographic area. It's the Washington, D.C. area. It's, the, uh, it's called the D.C. Uh, Circuit. There are, at, current, at present, there are eight members of, uh, of my court um, who have what is referred to as active status, full-time, not retired in any way. We have four, or uh, maybe it's five now, who are senior status uh, judges. That means they have, uh, they would be offended if I were to use the word retired because they haven't retired, but they've, they've reached an age and an experience level where they've cut back a little bit, yet they still they still uh, they still help out. And we have four, or five of those. We have uh, three vacancies uh, on our court. By statute, we're allowed to have eleven uh, judges. Uh, the president has nominated uh, uh, two individuals to to fill those seats. Their uh, nominations are pending uh, before uh, before the United States Senate uh, uh, now. Um, uh, we're, if you if you allow me to do a little bit of puffing about our court, I'm, we're, oh yes, ma'am, a question. Oh my goodness, you threw me off, but thank you. <laughs> the first question. I, now I'm nervous. Go ahead. Um, how many circuits are there total in the United States? There are uh, eleven regional circuits. Uh, there's an. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. There are twelve. Uh, there, there, there's one through 11 in D.C. We don't have a number. It's the D.C. Circuit, so there are 12. There's also one specialized court called the Federal Circuit, which deals largely but not exclusively in intellectual property matters. But, but there are 12 of these regional uh, uh, courts of appeal. So, see, I, I get my first question out of order, and I flub it, right? <laughs> um, let me a little bit about the history of our court, because it's... A, it's a, because of where we're located, the docket that we have is a little, uh, is a little unusual. Because we're in Washington, D.C., uh, uh, many of the cases we hear are actions that are brought challenging um, some action that's been taken by the federal government or one of them. For example, uh, if the Environmental Protection Agency uh, issues new regulations regarding the Clean Air Act saying, you know, uh, X particle can only be released in the atmosphere in Y amounts or penalties will ensue. Uh, they, they issue that rule, and, and it's fairly predictable what will happen. The uh, environmental groups will say, you're, being, uh, you're, you're, not, you're not being strict enough on the manufacturers. And the manufacturing groups will come and say, you're being too strict, we'll lose jobs. So, 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 so they both have incentives to challenge these. That, that challenge will typically often take place uh, in our court on a petition for review of that agency action. Somebody knows this number, I don't, but I think it's something like half of our cases uh, involve a challenge that someone has brought to some uh, executive agency, uh, agency action. And that's what makes, uh, one of the things that makes our court a little bit different uh, and unique. Uh, we don't have too many of the cases that uh, that people learn about uh, in first year of law school, uh, you know, property rights cases, uh, tort cases, you know, personal private injury cases, don't have too much of that. 
uh, in comparison with other with other courts because we have so many of these uh, administrative uh, law cases. Um, uh, one of the things that we're most uh, proud of is that uh, um, uh, a, a number of members of our court have gone on to serve on the United States Supreme Court. In fact, today, of the nine justices <coughs> on the United States Supreme Court, four of them uh, were elevated to their positions from the D.C. Circuit. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you questions. You want to take, let's take a guess. Who are the four members of the United States Supreme Court who served on the D.C. Circuit? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> Well, the Chief Justice, Chief Justice John Roberts, was a, was a, was a member of our, our court only for a couple of years before, uh, before he was elevated. Uh, Justice Scalia, uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and Justice Clarence Thomas were all alums, uh, so to speak, of the, uh, of, of the D.C. Circuit. So we're, you know, we're, we're, we're proud of that. Um, now, uh, how does one get to be a federal appeals court judge? I, I'm not certain I can answer that in general, but I can tell you what happened uh, with, with me. Uh, I was a partner in a law firm in Washington, D.C. for much of my uh, career and was active in um, uh, conservative lawyer events. I was a member of the Federalist Society. Uh, I was a member of the Republican Party. I worked in a limited way on a couple of uh, uh, national campaigns uh, for uh, uh, the first President Bush and, and, the, and the second President Bush. Um, but for me, uh, I, the, the critical event that, and, and, it's, and, and it's a little bit strange, it, the, being a federal appeals court judge was not something that I uh, ever s thought about or aspired to when I, was a, when I was a lawyer. And that's a little bit unfair, right? Because there are a lot of people who really like to do that and they spend their careers hoping that'll happen and it, it, and it doesn't. And then someone who, that wasn't uh, a, a, a major aspiration, I get lucky and get to do it. So that's not, that's not quite fair. But, um, uh, but the, 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 the juncture in my career that put me in a place where uh, there was a possibility that I would be on the Court of Appeals is something Professor Hawkins al uh, alluded to. In, in 1995, uh, Senator Robert Dole, who was the Republican leader of the Senate at the time, and the Republicans had um, uh, taken control of the Senate, uh, hired me to be the Senate Legal Counsel is the title. It's the, the chief legal officer of the United States Senate. It's, it's a nonpartisan position, uh, but Senator Dole uh, interviewed me and hired me for that. The Senate appointed me to that, and that was happened to be during a time uh, when Republicans had control of the Senate and were using the subpoena power with some uh, uh, fervor and frequency, and uh, much of their investigative power was directed uh, at, uh, at the Clinton administration. Uh, and so I began my service as Senate legal counsel contemporaneous with the Senate Banking Committee uh, beginning or uh, renewing its investigation into a series of real estate transactions that uh, Governor Clinton uh, was involved in, uh, called generally called Whitewater, the Whitewater matter. Uh, and so I began my time in the Senate when that uh, uh, investigation was, was, uh, was heating up. Um, at, now, my position was nonpartisan, but, uh, and it, it, it made for some interesting uh, days because uh, uh, on a, in a typical day, or, uh, uh, not a typical day, but not infrequently, the following scenario would play out. I would get a phone call from the uh, Republican counsel to the Banking Committee, to the Whitewater Committee, a uh, fellow whose name uh, is Michael Chertoff, who uh, later went on to be the uh, uh, Secretary of Homeland Security under under uh, the second President Bush. Mike Chertoff would call and say, Tom, I've got, a, I've got a sensitive question I need to discuss with you, so can I come to your office and talk about it? So he'd come to my office, would close the door, and he would share with me ideas and strategies that the Republicans had on the committee uh, to how to conduct their investigation and needed some legal advice about it. So I'd give him the give him the legal advice and he'd leave uh, the door, he'd leave my office and then the, the phone uh, would ring and his Democratic counterpart would call and say, Tom, I've got some really sensitive information I need to, to speak with you about. Can I come talk to you? He'd come and he'd, he'd come in and, and he'd be talking about the same issue but on the other side. And so you're thinking, you know, how do you, how do you avoid a conflict of interest in this? And the answer is you just do it. You just play it 
you play it straight, right? And you don't try and give one advantage to the other, uh, one side advantage to the other. So it was a fascinating job because it was nonpartisan, serving both Democrats uh, and Republicans in the Senate. Um, and during, uh, for me, uh, uh, just a fascinating time uh, in the Senate's history. Uh, of course, the culmination of that was the in impeachment trial of, of President Clinton, and our office was smack dab in the middle of it. So if, if, if you're one of those who thinks that that was not uh, one of the better moments in the history of the Senate, uh, you, you can lay some of the blame for that on, uh, on, on me and, and my office. On the other hand, if you think the Senate acquitted it well, we'll take some of the credit, although the major credit belongs to the, the major credit and bl or blame uh, belongs to the senators. But our office was, uh, once again, uniquely situated, being a nonpartisan uh, entity, uh, to advise both Democrats and Republicans on this uh, novel and difficult uh, problem. The House of Representatives had impeached the President of the United States under the Constitution. Uh, there, there needs to be a trial in front of the Senate to determine whether the President will be removed from office or not. So that was a unique uh, set of legal and political challenges uh, that we found ourselves in. And so uh, it, it was out of that experience, and it was really nothing more than just doing your job the best you can without playing to favorites on one side or the other, just being, as, as the statute that created our office required us to be nonpartisan, that uh, we got lots of positive uh, att attention uh, from that. And, and out of that experience, I, I uh, made friends with many uh, Democratic staff members and, and a number of Democratic senators. Um, I'm, now, the rest, uh, what I just told you, I can vouch for, and that's, that's true. The, what I'm about to tell you is what I've been told, so I don't know if this is true or not, but uh, this is what I've been told, that when the second President Bush was looking to put people on my court, the D.C. Circuit, uh, there was significant Democratic opposition to a number, he had actually nominated three people for the court, there was significant Democratic opposition to, to them. Uh, one of them was filibustered, Miguel Estrada, one of the finest lawyers in America, uh, was, was filibustered, and, uh, and, and for whatever reasons, personal reasons, whatever reasons, Miguel decided after a period of time that he was going to withdraw his name from consideration, and, and I'm told then the, the president was left with, with a decision, who do we nominate to, to fill that slot? And, uh, and I'm told that the, that the decision came down to two competing sets of interests. Uh, one, um, uh, should the president nominate someone who could be easily confirmed? Or, or two, should he nominate someone that would draw significant opposition the way uh, uh, Mr. Estrada did? Now, if you're thinking that that's an easy decision, then you haven't been in Washington long enough. <laughs> you haven't been in Washington long enough. It, actually, when I thought about that, I thought that's a pretty easy decision. You'd pick somebody who could be easily nominated, easily confirmed, right? But uh, again, the, the, the currents and eddies of, uh, of, of Washington political thinking run faster than, than my mind can figure out. So, so here, here, the, apparently, uh, the, uh, the Democratic filibusters were uh, something of a cash cow for the Republican Party at the time, uh, because it was a rallying cry um, for why uh, there ought to be more Republican senators, so you could break these, so you could break these filibusters. And so there was thinking by some, I'm told, that if, they, if the president nominated someone who could be easily confirmed, it makes that argument a little more difficult to make, right? Uh, and so, uh, so, so apparently that was the, the internal uh, debate that was going on within the White House, uh, 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 obviously. The president decided that he wanted to nominate someone who could be easily confirmed, and when he made that decision, it reduced the, 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 the pool uh, 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 drastically because it was a very toxic uh, atmosphere. The fact that I had these personal relationships with a number of Democratic senators, including uh, the majority leader of the Senate, uh, Senator Daschle, uh, and Senator Reid, who was the assistant majority leader, was very, and that, and that I had this history of having served both sides, was very, was, 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 uh, was very helpful. And so uh, I, that I was then uh, nominated. And uh, my confirmation wasn't quite as easy as I, as I had hoped. It didn't go quite according to plan, but it was, it was, uh, 
uh, it was uh, comparatively uh, uh, easy. Um, so wh what do you learn from that? If, you, if you'd like to become a federal judge, um, uh, you need to be a lawyer, right? Uh, you need to do a good job and, and uh, have the respect of your, of your peers. You also need to choose a side, right? Um, uh, there are many great opportunities and many good reasons to be politically independent. Uh, and I don't want to look askance on that at all. But one of the things that does not come to people who are politically independent are positions uh, that are chosen by the President of the United States, typically. Uh, and so um, uh, just realize that. Uh, um, uh, so uh, uh, you, you need to be involved. You need to do good work. You need to be uh, politically involved. And if you can get to know a senator, uh, that's pretty helpful. Uh, because of the crucial role that the Senate plays uh, in the, uh, the confirmation process of judges. Now, my court's a little bit different because being in Washington, D.C., senators don't have the same sort of, uh, in, by custom, senators don't have the same sort of influence on uh, choosing judges f for Washington, D.C. that they do in the rest of the country. And, and, and uh, uh, the White House plays an outsized role in the selection of judges for, for, for my court, perhaps more than, uh, than, in, than in the other courts. And so in that regard, I had the good fortune of having my closest friend from law school uh, be the person in the White House who made the recommendations to the president. He was actually the, the deputy counsel, the counsel to the president. The chief lawyer in the White House is the one who, uh, by recent tradition, uh, plays an outsized role in the recommendation of who the judges are to be. And his deputy was my uh, closest friend uh, from law school. That helped uh, a, a, gr a great deal. Um, so uh, how do you, what do I do? Um, uh, well, I come and give talks at BYU. This is a great deal of fun for me. Uh, but uh, this, isn't my, this isn't my day job. But one of the reasons I like to come and give talks is because my day job is a bit monastic. Um, uh, I've never quantified this, but I, I would... I would venture to say that 99% of my time uh, as a judge is spent in one of two activities, reading and writing. That's it. Uh, we spend very little time on the bench. Uh, in a typical month, uh, there will be three, uh, more like four days of the month where I will be on the bench, and that's typically just for the morning, for about 9.30 to 12, hearing these cases that I refer to. So you hear that and you say, that's a job I want. Four days a month, mornings only, it sounds pretty good. Uh, and if that's all there were to it, um, uh, maybe that would uh, be quite appealing. But uh, what, as I said, what you don't see is that there's an enormous amount of work that goes into uh, the preparation for that, uh, for that hearing. And so uh, most of what I do is I sit down and I open up the briefs. I open up materials that my law clerks have prepared for me to read, and I read them. Uh, if I have questions about them, I talk to my law clerks, but most of it is reading. Once a decision is made by the court, uh, uh, you have to write an opinion, uh, in most cases, write an opinion announcing uh, the outcome of that decision. Um, and uh, that begins a whole other process of, of careful writing. Justice Scalia has said publicly that, um, that his opinions go through five drafts, um, and, uh, um, and he is a remarkable writer. Uh, I, I'm not as good a writer um, my guess is, and I don't keep track of this, my guess is most of the opinions that come from our chambers go through about 10 drafts. Sometimes it'll be 20. That's a lot of writing and a lot of careful writing. So but that's what we, yes, sir. Been overlooking that hand, sorry. How many law clerks do you have to help you and your good, staff? Good question. We're, alla we're allowed to hire four, uh, up to four law clerks. Some judges uh, on my court only have three. Um, when I first became a judge, uh, I called our, our chief judge, a very distinguished uh, uh, judge, Douglas Ginsburg, and said, do you have advice for me about how many law clerks to hire? And he said, yes, 
don't hire more than three, otherwise they get in the way, and you have to manage, you know. I said, oh, yeah, that's good advice. And then I called a friend of mine who was a, a, a judge on the, the Tenth Circuit, uh, the court that sits, that covers, that includes Utah and sits in Denver, Michael McConnell, who's now a law professor at, at Stanford. And I asked Mike, I said, oh, so we have, how many clerks should I hire? He said, 10 if you can, you know, but you can't. You can so get as many as you want. So I, I, I hire uh, four law clerks. Um, they do a lot of work. Uh, at the beginning of the term, I tell them, uh, I'm a marathon runner. You're a sprinter. Sprint. <laughs> And they do. It's a lot of work. It's a, it's a great, I think it's a great experience for them, but it's a lot of work. Typically, uh, uh, law clerks are recent graduates of, of, of law school. Uh, uh, sometimes, at least it, in, in my experience, most of the law clerks I hire have just graduated from law school that spring, start working for me uh, in the summer, and serve uh, for a year. Uh, the law clerks, are, we're very fortunate on our, on our court. The, the law clerks who apply to our court, um, the, the competition is just staggering. It's staggering. We get anywhere between 600 and 800 applications for four slots, and, and the, the students that, that we see and eventually hire uh, are the, they're just the finest law, law uh, students from the finest law schools, and, uh, uh, and they're remarkable. Pe and the really bad news about it is they're really great people too. You know, you see these resumes and the things they've done, and so you're assuming, well, they probably have no social skills. And then you meet them, and you think, oh my gosh, they got great social skills. They probably have no balance in their life. And then you find out, no, they're deeply involved in family, church, synagogue, or you know, in community service. And you just, you, I, I'm perpetually feeling inadequate around them. So it's another one of those instances where life isn't fair, but. I've got the Article Three appointment, and they don't. So uh, the, I, the, I get the, the benefit from from them. Um, so so that's what uh, that's what a judge spends his or her time um, uh, doing. Now, um, fortunately, I think fortunately, uh, at least from my from my perspective, I really enjoy uh, the types of cases that we get uh, on our court because many of them are at the intersection of of law and politics. As I mentioned, many of them have to do with challenges to action taken by the federal government. And, uh, uh, and, s and, and many of them have this sort of rip from the headlines quality. Now, which headline are you reading? Uh, uh, rip from the pages of the Washington Post headline. Uh, and if you like that sort of stuff, which I do, uh, um, I, they're I think they're fascinating cases, that, and many of them have broad uh, implications that shouldn't but does heighten one's uh, interest and, 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 and focus in, in the preparation for them. Um, now, uh, what I'd like to do for the next couple of minutes is, is depart a little bit from talking about what I do as a judge and talk a little bit about my career up to then, because I hope there's some good and bad lessons to be learned from this. So um, uh, I as, as Professor Hawkins mentioned, I, I graduated from, from BYU uh, in humanities and comparative literature. I, I, I dabbled with political science a little bit. I'm from Washington, D.C. I had worked on Capitol Hill in high school, and I was, a, uh, I was and am a political junkie. But, but I, 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 I steered away from that in, 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 in college because I wanted to uh, have better exposure than I had then had to my life uh, to the grand tradition of the liberal arts. And so I studied humanities and comparative literature and, and, and loved it. But realized that um, unless I was going to go on and get a doctorate in, in that field that I probably have to go to law school. Um, and so I went to law school at the University of Virginia and I just hated it. I just hated it. I felt inadequate. My classmates were intimidating to me. I, I didn't find the material that I was studying nearly as interesting as comparative literature. Uh, and so I quit. Uh, I, I, it was a strategic quit of law school. I quit about a month before final exams. <laughs> and, and the primary reason I quit was because I had no confidence that I was going to survive those. It was really, you know, I had, I had done quite well as an undergraduate, and then I went to law school and I felt that I was not doing well. And it was a, it was a bruising experience uh, for me, but I quit before a, a permanent record could be made of it. <laughs> and, so, um, and so I quit and I went to work for the church educational system. Um, you know, I ran to the monastery. Uh, and taught in seminaries and institutes for about three years. I actually loved, loved the experience. 
at the end of that period of time, I thought maybe I was a bit hasty in my uh, retreat from law school. So I went back, I reapplied and, and was accepted at the University of Virginia again and went back to law school and, and this time stuck it out. I, I have to tell you, it was no more enjoyable to me the second time uh, for, for pressing forward for three years than it was as the first time. The happiest day of, outside obvious moments of your baptism, your marriage, things like that. I was put, putting to one side the really important stuff, um, outside of those events, the happiest day of my life was the day I graduated from law school. <laughs> it, no, it really was. It was, and a lot of it was just sheer relief. Uh, um, uh, that has been eclipsed since then. Uh, uh, I was I was at Rice Eccles Stadium uh, when when John Beck found Johnny Harleen open in the end zone on that pass. I was there. I was actually in the president's box at the University of Utah. It was, it was a, and that was I, I have to say that was a happier moment. Uh, but but th those are the two those are the two happy stories. <laughs> no no I won't tell those stories. <laughs> I won't tell the story. This is being recorded. I won't tell those stories. <laughs> Let's just say when, when, the, when, the, when the winning touchdown was scored, I did not represent uh, the university well. <laughs> I, just, I just lost it. Something snapped in me and I went completely crazy in, in delirium. And I was a, it was rude to do that, but uh, sorry. So, so here's the point. So, so, so I did church education. So I went back to law school, went to a, a law firm in Charlotte, North Carolina, and, and I will tell you the experience that I had there. I had been there about a year and a half or two years when I had an opportunity to return to my home in Washington uh, and, and, and do something related to the law that sounded very interesting. So I went to my mentor at the law firm, told him about this. Now, part of the reason I told him about this is I wanted him to know that I was being considered for this. You know, it was, but also, I wanted to know his, his ideas. This is a good, good thing to do. And his advice to me, and this is what I want you to remember, he said, Tom, he said, I wouldn't do that if I were you. You'll have to admit that your resume has a certain staccato quality about it. Well, he intended that as a criticism. Uh, I took it as a challenge. I thought, you know, I like that. I like the fact that thus far, I've been able to do lots of different things. And so if my, my resume was staccato at that point, oh, you ought to see it since then. I've never held, the job I have right now, I've, I've held it for seven years. I've never held any job, anything close to this period of time. Um, it all started in the mission field. You know, you get transferred every six months. And so I've always, after six months, I'm always looking for something different. And in my, in my profession, it's, it's, it's worked out the way. Now, now that there are decided costs of that. And one of them is frequently financial. But uh, as my wife, if she were here, she would tell you, Tom has never met a pay cut he didn't embrace. <laughs> you know. So, so, but I, I've done a series of things. And but for me, I, I, I've really enjoyed it. I've been in private practice. I did government service with the Senate. Worked for uh, my alma mater, uh, undergraduate. I had no background in higher education law. Came here, loved that experience, and now. This job. Now I'm set on this. this is a lifetime appointment. I'm 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 set on this one. Although when I was approached about this and I was talking to my wife about it, she was she was a little bit worried because I was now, you know, uh, I was at that time I was at the law firm. I was a partner in a law firm, and it, it looked like, you know, financial stability was in our future. You know, not too far down there. And here I'm entertaining this idea of becoming a, a, a judge, and we're paid fine, but not obviously nothing compared to partner in a major firm in Washington, D.C. And so as I was talking to her about this, she said, well, honey, what, what is it about being a federal judge that appeals to you? And uh, I said to her, well, you know, it's a, it's a lifetime appointment. She paused and she said, you've never held any job for more than four years. Now, what is it about a lifetime appointment that sounds appealing to you? And I had to admit she, she, had, she had the better of the argument. But uh, the point of that is, um, if I were doing it all over again, I think I'd, I think I'd do it much the same. Um, if you can find your passion, pursue it. Um, now, within reason, I mean, you know, you do have, unless you live on a trust fund, you, you do have obligations 
uh, and responsibilities, and, and, you, and those are important. You need to, to tend to those. Um, but uh, don't, let, don't let a false sense of what those entail get in the way of following uh, your passions. Now, you may, you may not know what your passion is. Uh, law, uh, practicing law at a private law firm was not my passion. Uh, I, that was the ticket I punched to get to somewhere else I wanted to go. And those eight or nine years practicing law at a private law firm and getting to be, you know, getting the, the, the punch of being a partner, those were hard years. I, I can remember moments coming out of the, the subway at Farragut North in Washington, D.C. It's 645 in the morning and it's cold and raining in, Dece in, in February and the winds howling down the street and the only thing I'm thinking of is by the sweat of your brow shall you eat bread <laughs> all the days of your life. It's hard. This is hard. It's not, uh, it, w I w it wasn't until I was 40 years old and I got this job as the Senate legal counsel that I could honestly say I loved my work. And, and, and that one, uh, no exaggeration here, I couldn't wait to get to work each day. I really couldn't. Uh, and that's a, that was, I feel, very, and, and I've been that way, I'm now 58, the last 18 years. It's just been that one after another. So I've been very fortunate. But, but the point is, it didn't come, didn't come immediately, you know, and it, and it might not ever come. But you gotta try, right? This, I tried for a number of years to think, this was my approach to the, the career issue. Uh, I tried to think, look, uh, what you do with your job is secondary, and it clearly, it's not even secondary, it's way down the list, but it's not nearly as important as what you're doing with your family and with helping build the kingdom, right? And, that, and that's, that's all true. Uh, and so I found myself in, in positions where, um, I really didn't like what I was doing, but I thought this is the price you have to pay to be with, to do family and to to build the kingdom. Uh, and uh, and and if that's the situation you're in and you have no options, then you do the work to build family and build kingdom, and and you you suffer at work, and that's fine. That's fine. But you spend an awful lot of time at work, and if you can, you may not be able to, but if you can follow your passion and be able to keep your covenants and work with family and help build the kingdom. If you can do that, you got to try that because uh, I found that uh, it was really hard to work 50, 60 hours a week at something that I just didn't love. I found that very draining um, in, in, in not so good ways. And so I made the decision when I was uh, um, in, in my uh, mid-30s that I was going to take a risk and go a different direction. Now, I got very lucky. It, 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 it paid off very well. The real challenge would be if it didn't pay off and, and, it, and, and you didn't get what you wanted to do, would you still do it? And I think the answer to that is yes, right? I, th I think you gotta you got to... You gotta, you gotta have, you know, you gotta dream dreams, and you gotta pursue them. And then if they don't work out, that's fine, that's fine. But the worst thing I, th I think, uh, on the career side, is to not pursue um, your dreams, uh, to, to, to not have dreams. That would be worse, right? But then the next would be to have dreams but not uh, pursue them. And you may, you know, you may get, uh, you you may get lucky. Okay, so that's some advice. Now some other advice along the way. The most important advice I can give to you as you're thinking about your careers down the road is to be nice to people. And I really mean that. I, I, I cannot be more serious about that. Be nice to people. Now, l th and the, the reason we're supposed to be nice to people is because the Lord tells us to be nice to people, okay? Okay, and I believe that. Now, let's imagine, and I hope you're not a person like this, but let's imagine that you could care less what the Lord has to say, okay? And, and the only thing that you care about is advancing your petty, egotistical interest. That's, the o that's what drives you. That's the demon that drives you, is how can I get ahead? Okay, so we're in that world. We're in that 
devilish Machiavellian world. Okay, let's imagine we're there right now. You know what my advice to you is? The best way to get ahead is to be nice to people. No, be nice to people. Uh, and, and you've already seen in your life, and you will yet see, people who have temporary success at the expense of being nice to people. But I'm telling you now, you know, as an old man with gray hair, uh, that's short-lived. It doesn't, it, those people do not, at least in, rarely do they stay in power unless they're a potentate from some corrupt regime in Central Africa or something like that. But, but in the world that you and I are going to live in, it doesn't. Be nice to people because it's the right thing to do, and it, all, it, will, also, it will also benefit you. Um, um, you never know. You never know the person that you're dealing with today, who they're going to be, and how they're going to be able to help you down the road. So you see why, even if, even if you're just thinking about your own self-interest, be nice to everyone. Okay, now let's talk about the real reason we do it. Um, uh, C.S. Lewis put it best. Uh, next to the blessed sacrament, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. Act that way. Life's a whole lot better. It's true, and life's a whole lot better that way, and you'll enjoy your career better. So that's the first bit of advice, maybe unconventional. The next one's more conventional. Pay careful attention to detail. Detail, detail, detail. That's what supervisors want, right? Supervisors don't have time to pay attention to detail. You, as you're starting your career, make time to pay attention to detail. Um, all of the really big mistakes I've made in my career, and I've made some huge mistakes. The, 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 the comfort of having an Article III lifetime appointment allows me to, 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 I'm done, I don't have any more confirmation hearings, so I can tell you. I've made some huge mistakes. And all of them, all of them share one thing in common. I was too embarrassed to admit that I didn't know the answer. And out of that embarrassment, I handed in work product that was not done or complete. And the only reason I handed in it was because I was embarrassed that it was take, that it would take me that much time to do the work, okay? And whenever I did that, I mean, it was almost like I could hear this little voice, you know, it's like the, the, the shoulder angel guy, you know, telling me, don't turn it in, don't turn it in. But I'm looking at the partner or the supervisor and I'm thinking, yeah, he wants it now, and if I, don't, if I tell him I need five more hours of that, he's gonna think I'm an idiot. So you turn it in and I, it, uh, and then the mistake is discovered and you're, you're toast, right? On the other hand, the really good things I've done in my career, and I'll say this sound rather immodestly, I've done some really, really good things in my career. All of them share one thing in common. I paid attention to detail. I took extra time to work it, to get it just right. Story about that. So I'm, at this time, this story, I'm the Senate Legal Counsel. The impeachment is coming down the pike. And uh, make a long story short, uh, I was working on uh, a memo that was going to be given to the then Republican leader of the Senate, Trent Lott, and to the Democratic leader of the Senate, Tom Daschle. Uh, and they knew I was working on this, and uh, Senator Lott called me, quite anxious to get this memo. Uh, our whole office was working on it. Uh, we had some sense that this was gonna be pretty important. Uh, and, uh, and, and Senator Lott's staff told me, we gotta have the memo, gotta have the memo. And then he, they even got Senator Lott to call me from his vacation home. Where's the memo, where's the memo? You know, and uh, my answer was, we're working on it, it's the top priority. You will get it the second it's done, but it's not done yet. It's not done. And that, you now Senator Lott only called me once, but his staff, uh, members of his staff were pressing, pressing us for it. And we resisted, and you know what? We did a great job. We did a fabulous job on this. And because of the great job that we did, that, was rec that our office did, recognized by both sides, when the impeachment came, we were brought right into the middle of it because we had earned the trust of both Senator Lott and Senator Daschle because it was really, 
really good work. So that's one, just one example. Just do the good work, swallow your pride, and, but get the work done as, as, best, as best you can. Okay, last bit of advice. Uh, actually, two bits, one, one more story. It's gonna sound simple, but it's so true. Learn to write and speak clearly. Oh my goodness, that, 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 that is such a rare find. And now that's related to the idea that I just told you before. And that's be careful, pay attention to detail. But write and speak clearly. Now here's my story on that. You've heard the name Rex Lee, I, ho I hope. Rex Lee was uh, the founding dean of the law school here. He was president of the university for a while before he succumbed to cancer. Uh, but he was also the Solicitor General of the United States, which is the, the, the government, the United States lawyer who argues before the Supreme Court. It is, by, by many people's accounting, and, and I include myself in this, the most important and prestigious lawyer's job in the United States. You're representing the United States in argument for the Supreme Court. And Rex Lee had a reputation as being among the finest advocates in front of the United States Supreme Court in the history of the court. So uh, when I was in law school, uh, he and I, I lived in his ward back in Northern Virginia. Uh, uh, he knew me from that. He invited me to see him argue in the Supreme Court. Uh, so my 30-year law school, I went and watched, I was a guest of the Solicitor General, watched him argue in front of the Supreme Court. I had never been in any court before. And here I am watching the great, the great Rex Lee argue. And I remember, the, I remember it well. Uh, his opponent stood up to argue first, and, and as I recall, his opponent was a, a law school professor from some prestigious law school who was arguing the other side of the case. And, and this fellow launched into his argument, and I thought, oh my gosh, this guy is fabulous. I mean, this guy, he's brilliant. He is so articulate. A and, and I know he's brilliant because you know, I really can't understand anything he's saying. <laughs> no, no, and, and, and I knew my law school professors were brilliant because I couldn't understand them either. And so this guy is really good. So he finishes, and then Rex Lee gets up, and he begins his argument. And I, 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 I'm reliving this moment right now. I can see Rex arguing, and my heart sank. I mean, it really did. And I was, I was embarrassed for him. I mean, I, was I thought, oh my gosh, Rex, th this is the great Rex Lee? Are you kidding me? This is so embarrassing. It, it, it feels like I'm in a gospel essentials class. No, I really did. That's, that's the thing. I said, he, th you know, it, where's the chalkboard? And, you know, yeah. this is so embarrassing because, because I, I can understand everything he's saying. Well, you get the point. Rex Lee was great because of that, because he could take complex ideas, reduce them to their essentials, and then explain them in simple ways. I mean, it's, it's, it's why we all love C.S. Lewis, right? And Lewis talks about that. Lewis says, if you can't get out of the jargon, guess what? You don't understand your topic. No, you don't. You don't understand your topic if, if you have to resort to jargon. If you can't explain your ideas in plain English, then they're muddled. So work at that. And that, now you have the background and the training to do that because you go to church, right? No, the best training ground for this is to teach the CTRA class. Go ask for that assignment. I'm serious. Go, you know, when you get in a real war, go ask for that assignment because if you can teach simply and powerfully, it makes all the difference. And, all, and it comes from clear thinking, clear thinking. Okay. Quickly, read broadly. Read a lot. You know, the, I, there's always this advertisement out here at the, the coming into the Kennedy Center about New York Times. I hope you you have educated people, whether you like the New York Times or not. Educated people read the New York Times. It's what you do. No, you do. It's it's the common, you know, it's it, it's the lingua franca of educated people. And if you, seriously, if you're not reading the New York Times regularly. You're missing out on something. And not just the New York Times. You, you have to read, you read the Washington Post. You read first things, right? Okay, yeah, I like first. You read the Weekly Standard, yay. But you also read the New Republic. You read Atlantic. You read all of these things. And that's, here's the bad news. That takes time. It, it takes time. And it, and it may mean that you don't get to see as much of the Daily Show or Colbert Report as otherwise, but that's okay. 
you, you read broadly and widely. You don't just watch Fox because it's comforting to you, but you watch MSNBC as well, or vice versa, or vice versa. Ed educated people do that, okay? Pick a side. You gotta be on one side or the other. Th that's my point about political independence. There's, there's a lot, lots of virtues of being politically independent, but you don't get to play the game. Um, uh, last bit of advice is we're running out of time. And the most important bit of advice, build the kingdom. That's what it's all for. That's what it's all for, is to build the kingdom. You have to figure out a way that your career aligns with the atonement of Christ. Now, if you are a social worker helping people in drug rehab programs, that's pretty easy to figure out, right? And you're doing that. And many of you should do that. Okay? If you're working at Goldman Sachs, it's a little bit more of a challenge, but you, but you, but, no, but you can do it. You, you, you can do it. And, and I hope for those of you who are inclined that way that you will, that you'll go to Goldman Sachs and you will make an obscene amount of money to help build the kingdom, right? To clothe the naked, feed the hungry, care for those who've been pushed to the margins of society. But you know what? If you're at Goldman Sachs or at a law firm, you pick it up. If that's not what you're doing, if that's not your motivation, I have some really bad news for you. You are going to hell. <laughs> you will have your temple recommend, because no one's going to ever ask you this question. And, and it, like you, will burn, OK? The temple recommend, I love it. Keep, stay worthy of a temple recommend. But, but it's never going to ask you the really big question. And that is, what have you done with these 60 hours a week, 40 to 60 hours a week? What are you doing with that? And if in that time you're not building the kingdom, you're missing the forest for the trees. You're missing the whole point. So how do you, you want to be at the end of your life where Thomas More was, right? Where he's about to be beheaded because in his great service to the king, there was one thing he wouldn't do, and that was he wouldn't violate his deepest held feelings and commitments to Christ. And so his last words, maybe you know it, Moore said, said right before he was beheaded, I die the king's good servant, but God's first. Now, when I was in your place, uh, president Kimball was president of the church, and he talked about a style of our own. It was dress and grooming standard. That was, that was the phrase. We have a style of our own. We dress differently. We groom differently. We listen to different sort of music. A style of our own. And I'm all for that. I'm all for that. Um, we need to have a style of our own when it comes to careers. Not that we necessarily do different things, but we do them for different reasons. And the reason all of us should be doing what we're doing is that it aligns with the atonement of Christ and we're here to build the kingdom. Okay, I'm done, we're out of time. Any questions? Yes, go ahead. My question is just that, um, thank you very much first of all for the various speeches you've given here. I, I think. Uh, for me, I've felt like a lot of the same passion you have for like the law. So my question is, in turning this into a career, um, what job did you work that you felt that passion? Like, how did you enjoy going yeah, to work? Yeah, general counsel of BYU, for me, just my particular interest, because I, I love universities, I love this university and what it can be, and to work, and, and, and the job that I had here, most of my time was spent on religious liberty issues with other uh, uh, religious colleges and universities trying to preserve our place at the table. So that was something I got very excited about and passionate about. And, and uh, so th that was, f for me, to this day, and I love the job I have right now, and I love the Senate job, but for me, um, the, and I was, I was general counsel when the sports teams weren't doing that great. So it wasn't just, you know, <laughs> you know it wasn't just that. It's, it was the idea of being here, trying to help BYU become what it can be, but is not yet. Uh, yes, sir. 
and, and you, those of you who need to go, feel free to go. I'm sorry I took so much time, but I'll take questions as long as you, as long as he'll let me. So it seems like nowadays um, it takes about 10 to 15 years to become a partner at a law yeah. firm. Um, Not quite that long. I mean, okay. 10, 10, yeah, 8 to 10, so I think. So like how, how did you do it if you didn't help hold the job for more than four years? Well, okay, that's a good question. So, so, uh, so I was an associate at, a law, at one law firm for four years. I went to another law firm where I was an associate for four years and became partner. Uh, and then I left and went to the Senate. And so, so you break it up that way. At least I broke it up that way.